Well, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate that prayer because I certainly, I certainly uh, need that prayer. So let's continue about what we talked about. That that you know it was uh, really from a vantage point that we talked about last week that God is crazy about us. That He is He is seeking a relationship with us. He sets up uh, us up in situations so that we can ultimately seek Him and find him, as the scripture says, though he's not far from us. And he's done this not because he's mad at us, but because he is filled with and with grace and mercy. And I'll continue, and we'll go back to that scripture, like I talked about last week, that that's what I was going to expound on this week. And this is what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. You can certainly turn there, or you can just listen. It says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show, get this, the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now, those are some absolutely amazing statement mm. that that the, the, the grace of God, and by the way, it's futile to even try and compare it because it's incomparable, right? And, and so, but that's what in Christ Jesus, God has displayed how rich he is in mercy, and how gracious he is expressed in, in kindness to, uh, to Jesus. So here's what I would say, that what we're going to talk about today, it's what, what's known as the gospel. Now, I'm going to say a few minutes what the gospel is not. The gospel is not about being a better parent to your kids, even though being a follower of Christ would enhance that. The gospel is not even being a better spouse, even though being a, a follower of Christ helps you to be a, a better spouse. The gospel is not about you having even a happy life or not even having a fulfilled life, even though those things can accompany following Christ. It's really important, and I think a little sad that sometimes turning on, and, and, and I, I, I'm a little hesitant to be critical because that's not my point here, but my point is differentiation. At, at times when you turn on someone who purports to be a follower of Christ and talk about pop psychology out there, and unfortunately, it helps people to think that that's what the gospel is all about having a nice show on a Sunday morning, you know, uh, uh, projecting uh, uh, an image of these things, and we should have a nice show and all these kinds of things. But what we want to talk about is this incomparable grace expressed in kindness of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk about a couple of things here that, that are some highfalutin words, but hopefully I'll break it down for you. All right. And, and one of the things that we do here is this. What we do is, is uh, get people uh, interested and really stir their minds to how great our God is. And then what we do, we try to do one of the hallmark of this community, faith community, is that we walk people through individually, taking them where they're at to really help them more in their relationship with God. And that's something that you're interested in, then by all means, we certainly want to do something like that. But I want to talk about two concepts of God that is important to understand the gospel. One concept is that God is holy. Now, that's a pretty, that's a pretty uh, interesting word. It's not a word that we normally use in our everyday vernacular unless we're probably swearing or something. All right. And, 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 but, but holy literally means to be set apart uh, and to be so righteous and so holy that there's no sin in us. And in God, who is perfect, 
there is no sin in him. Now, here's one of the things I want you to understand. This is God's nature. Now, let me explain the this difference between nature and what he chooses to be. God does not choose to be holy. He is holy. That's his nature. It's what he is. And by definition, it's who God is. And so it's not an issue, hey, I'm going to choose to be holy today. It's by definition who God is. And, and, and the scripture tells us, and there are a lot of metaphors that is used to illuminate this, act, this concept. The Bible talks about God is light. In him, there's no darkness. Sin is darkness. And that, of course, by definition, right, darkness is an absence of light. And therefore, they, can't, they cannot dwell together. It's not possible. So by nature, God, who is light, God, who is holy, cannot dwell with that which is unholy, that is sinful. Now, we'll talk about how God dealt with that situation through his grace and his mercy expressed in his kindness. Another thing that God is that is very important for us to understand in, in his nature, I'm going to use a half dollar word now, okay, he, he is immutable. The idea of immutability is that God does not change, nor can he change. And so that's an important concept to understand. So God who is holy, God who is righteous, God in whom there is no darkness, God in whom where there's a wall of sin that separates us from God is also immutable. He does not change. That's what, that's what that uh, little big word really means. It's God does not change. And that's his nature again. Now, one of the great things about the fact that God is Im immutable, that he does not change, is that we can be secure in who he is and what he is all about. That he's not, as the scriptures sometimes say, shift like the, uh, uh, shift, uh, like the uh, blowing wind. God does not change like that. It's not like one day he'll get up. You know, you and I are different. Sometimes we can't relate to that. One morning we'll get up and we feel awesome. We can change the world. The next morning we get up and we wonder, who is, am I living with? Who are these people? Who do I work for? What are my friends doing? You know, so the idea that sometimes we change, and sometimes it's hard to relate to that concept, but God is holy and God is unchanging in his nature. Once again, the idea of nature expresses the idea that it's not something that you choose to be, it's something that you are. That's just by nature, okay? And, and, and so that's an important dynamic for us to understand. Now, the idea that God is light and God who is now um, uh, sinless, and now man, if you remember the story in the Garden of uh, Eden, had betrayed God because of their own choice that, that man chose to sin. And so thus separated themselves from God. Once again, with the idea that light and darkness, sin and uh, holiness cannot dwell together. And God has concocted a plan that man now needs to be reconciled to God. The plan that the Bible talks about is the idea that sin needs to be pain, paid for. That idea of breaking that law needs to be reconciled. It needs to be reckoned. It needs to be uh, uh, ransomed. It needs to be, that debt needs to be paid. And so the idea then is that God now has expressed this I th this in Christ Jesus. So let's look a little bit more in the book of um, in the book of First Corinthians, ch chapter five, that talks a little bit more about this. And and then if we've got any questions about sorry, Second Corinthians chapter five, my my bad, Second Corinthians chapter five. Um, and then I'm going to ask Melanie to share a little bit in, in, in a couple of seconds. The idea of, of 
Christ becoming what he needed to become for us and how that helped her in her relationship with God, in her journey as she walked with God. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, um, it, it says this in verse 20. It says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Now here's, here's the crazy part, right? God in trying to help people to understand how gracious and merciful he is, he has chosen people, flawed people like you and I, to be his ambassadors for this message. Earlier, he called this this message of reconciliation, this message of bringing the light and uh, getting rid of the darkness and breaking down that wall. And he has used people. And so this is one of those times I really believe that it's about helping people to understand that uh, uh, this this message needs to be understood. So Paul continues to write, he says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And here it is. God made him who had no sin, that is Christ Jesus, by the way, to be sin for us so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Right here is the essence of Right here is the essence of the gospel message. The essence of the gospel message is that Christ became sin for us. Now, that's a pretty heavy, heavy thing, right? But I mean, what does that even mean? Um, the idea is because sin's penalty, even all throughout the New Old Testament and the New Testament, the sin's penalty is death. That was always the plan. Sin's penalty is death. How are we going to deal with this issue? And so God sent his son in Jesus Christ to pay that penalty for us. Now, here's the, here's the amazing complication and beauty about this all. In order for sin to be paid for, it needs to be done with a lamb that is used that is unblemished, that is without fault. And that's why you may have heard Jesus, in spite of the fact that he had no sin, he was unblemished. He said, I am going to take on other people's sin. So I will pay their penalty and give them a chance to be reconciled to you, Father. Now, I'll tell you this. I have three children. I only count two. No, I'm only kidding. I have three children. And if someone asks me to do that, that would be the most difficult thing in the world. And yet Jesus chose to not only come down and to resist temptation, and not resist temptation, but resist sin, even in temptation, he became the, the unblemished lamb where all the sins of the world. And then you might ask, wait a minute. I thought Jesus and God, who is Jesus, God's son, how, how does that work? Well, if you, uh, and like I said, we can look at this at another time in more detail. The Bible tells us when the sin of the world was placed on Jesus, God was separated from his son for the first time in his life. Even his son faced the penalty of death, not because of what he had done, but because of what we had done. And so I'm going to expand on this a little uh, in a few minutes, but I wanted mainly to share about what, what about that as you journeyed in your relationship with God that brought about this idea, my goodness, I was substituted. Oh my goodness. Jesus took on my sins of the world. Yeah. If you could please. Yeah. I think for me, I think I shared a little bit about this last week, but, um, I think I understood the cross from a distance, almost the way that a spectator would understand something, right? That I knew that it happened. I, I heard that it happened. I even understood a little bit about um, 
if we can ask whoever is unmuted to mute, <laughs> that'd be great. Um, so I understood it from that spectator's perspective, but I didn't, I didn't have a very personal understanding of what that meant. And so part of that journey was first understanding what the cross meant and then specifically understanding what Jesus went through. Because I think when you look at it from a religious perspective or a spectator perspective like myself, I think you see it as something that he was supposed to do. So he's God in the flesh. He's supposed to come to earth. He's supposed to die. That's what he did. Awesome. Great. Um, but when you actually understand what happened, the, it changes everything. It, it, and then it makes the idea that he was substituted for me that much more powerful. And what I mean is there's, there's certain scriptures like in John 3, 16, I always sort of heard that scripture because it's probably the most famous scripture in the world. But the idea of God so loving the world, I, that didn't mean anything to me you know, again, from a spectator perspective, or that at just the right time he died for me, that did not mean anything to me. It only came to mean something to me when I, for the first time, acknowledged my part in that, mm. in that I acknowledged that it was actually my sin. It, it was actually what I did <laughs> that was even um, cause for the cross, that, that my particular sin and the, the fact that Jesus had to die for my son so that I could have that washed away and be reconciled to God, that's when it became a little more personal. And then it even went deeper, I think, when I came to understand that one, Jesus experienced the cross like any other human being would have experienced it. Because I think in my mind, I always sort of thought there was a part of his divinity that separated him from that experience, that he was somehow um, not able to feel the pain that you and I would feel. And yet when you read scripture, you understand that in all of his humil um, humanity, Jesus experienced the cross, that the pain, the humiliation, the betrayal, the 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 suffering, the suffering from his father, being separated from his father, that was all not just divinely experienced, but very much humanly experienced. And I think the thing that kind of just was for me, you know, the tipping point was um, in Matthew 26, it talks about Jesus being in the garden. And this is the night before he's going to be crucified. And in it, the Bible says, two things, that he was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, and that he cries out to God three different times, may this cup be taken from me. And I think for the first time I thought, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that he didn't actually physically want to experience pain, <laughs> you know, that, that even though he knew this was going to happen, the human side of him was in anguish over what he was about to experience and pleaded with God for there to be another way. And, and then just the, the idea that after that pleading that he said, your will be done, it will be done as you say. I, I think that just, because I think when I'm in those similar situations where I feel that sense of, you know, desperation and despair, it is the least sacrificial that I am. <laughs> it's, the, it's the time where I, you know, to my shame, I can't say that I, I often am sacrificial. I mean, I'm just the least sacrificial. And it's in that moment when Jesus obviously had the power to stop the event, didn't in, in his human form want to experience and was in such anguish but in that moment said, not my will, your will be done. So then when the Bible says at just the right time, when I was still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's not just, that's not just a religious phrase. He literally died for me. And it is a humbling and inspiring and encouraging. It's it, it, the cross is so many things. But more than anything, it, 
the cross motivates me. It, it propels me. It compels me to live every day, regardless of yesterday, to live every day in the hopes that my life will glorify God because I can't look, you know, I used to, when I was a younger Christian, I used to think when it was really, really difficult in my life, I used to envision, you know, if I decide to leave God today, if I decide this is too much and I can't do it, then I would have this mental picture of facing God in the end of time <laughs> and looking at him and telling him why I left. And then him saying, but how was my son's sacrifice not enough for what you went? And I just could never picture myself saying, no, God, his sacrifice was not enough. My pain was greater. And so just that the power and depth of the cross is just, it's it, nothing communicates the depth of God's love for me and for all mankind like the cross. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And what I hear you sharing there is a couple of things. You know, a word that's often thrown out is I have a personal relationship with God. Sometimes people use that in the context of God is like a cosmic bellhop mm. that when I want him, because he's my personal relationship, I ring that bell and he comes to my beck at my beck and call. Yeah. And that's not what the scripture says here. He's, I have a personal relationship with him because he became sin, not only for the world, but for me. Yeah. So that I was substituted for that I who deserve death, that I receive that. And so this idea of a personal relationship with God is not necessarily about, about uh, um, God is just there to answer all my prayers that I need more money, that I need a nicer car, a better husband, a better wife, better children, nicer house, greener lawn, <laughs> um, but, but whatever it is. And I think it's really important that we don't ever lose the essence of what the kindness of God expressed in Jesus is all about. It's not about getting more joy. That may happen. It may not happen. It's not about God helping me with my headaches. It's not about me living in a nicer neighborhood. The number one thing and the sole idea of the, the, the gospel, the kindness expressed in Jesus is that Christ became sin when he had no sin for those who are sinful. That is for me. And that is for you. Just in case we're wondering, you know, uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, it tells us who, who falls in this category of, um, of sin. In Romans chapter 3, you may be familiar with this passage, but I'll read it in this context again. It says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, that's both scary and encouraging. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the double-edged sword there, right? The, the, the encouraging part is that none of us are better off than the other person. One of the things that human do, human beings do, they we do relative righteousness, <laughs> right? That's what we do a lot. Hey, um, I pray more longer than you. I was crying in my prayer. I must be more righteous than you. I fasted for four days. You did three? Good. Thanks for telling me. I'm going to do four. And I, I, or I give more sacrificially. You give 12%. I'm going to give 12 and a half to, 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 to be. And so, uh, you know, uh, it's a little comical there. But the idea there is that all of us are in the same boat. That's kind of encouraging. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, initially, it's so funny. When I was studying the Bible to learn more about God, I was very pretentious. I didn't want to let people know what was going on. The lust, the greed, the selfishness, the rage, the anger. I mean, you just name it. That was going on in my life. The things that are described as sin. And because I thought these people wouldn't be as impressed as they are with me. 
I was so full of myself, I thought they were impressed with me, right? And so I figured, hey, let me not give you the entire picture here. That was my initial thought. And yet, when I started to understand who God is and who Jesus Christ is and what he did for me, then it was amazing. I actually started sharing my life. And you know, an amazing miracle happened. I actually became closer to the people. The people weren't less in, impressed by me. They were more impressed by my willingness to share about what is going on. And so the idea that we have all sinned is a very encouraging thing. And, 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 and it tells me that we're all in the same boat. We're all in need of a savior. And this relative righteousness is not anything that is biblically based, at least when it comes to Christ paying for our sins. Now, the scary part of this is it means we're all separated from God. It means that there's not one of us. It doesn't matter how we have lived our lives. There's not one of us that could be saved from what the Bible describes as spiritual death in Romans chapter 6. And so therefore, that's where Christ comes in. That's where Christ, and here's the nuttiest part of this. There is nothing by definition that we can do. That's what grace means. Grace means we get what we don't deserve. That there's nothing that we can do to say, I have earned this. That is, that is stunning. Absolutely stunning. Mercy, as I explained last week, is, is, is a little different, is that we don't get what we deserve. Since separation from God, spiritual death is what we deserve of sin. God, in his mercy, in providing Christ to be the atonement for that sin. So on one hand, we get what we don't deserve. On the other hand, we don't get what we we deserve. And hopefully that's not too confusing. But I've heard this phrase before. It says love is described as, as a, a two-sided coin. And one side is mercy. The other side is grace. And it, it, it's sort of like that time when we give our kids something that they don't deserve. And sometimes we say we don't punish them when, when they really, really deserve it. And so that's the idea of mercy and grace in what is described here. And so this idea that what God has done for us, let it never, ever be misunderstood. And so this idea, and I remember growing up, I don't know if you were anything like this, right? I remember growing up religious. I actually grew up, really, I started going to church ever since I was five years old, okay? And what I used to do, I used to do things that I thought will tip the scales in my favor. That's the way I viewed God. I viewed if I did more good things than I did bad things, then that that's how it works. That was awesome. I mean, I just, I just want to score one more goal than the opponent. Okay. I just, that's what I want to do. And, and, and if I do that, I'm there. Okay. And here's what I'm embarrassed to say this, but here's what I would do at times. There are times I would actually pick a lint from someone's coat. And I thought, Hey, that's on the good side. Fire me up. Okay. All right. And, or, or, or there's some other times, let me help someone to cross the road and that is going to help me. That's a big one. Okay. All right. That's, that, 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 that's a, that's a heavier weight. One was a one ounce. This must've been an eight ounce, so to speak. And, and so what enveloped my mind is this idea of that's who God is. The concept of grace and mercy was purely theological words that I did not even understand, nor did I even honestly want to. <laughs> and I said, that's great who God is, but what does it really mean? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't really matter. And, and, and yet, as I started to understand the concept of who God is and the gospel message, that Christ became the substitution. And here it is. You know, I've heard it described this way. God was trying to say, what can I do to communicate how much I love you? I've sent prophets to talk about me. I've sent priests to talk about me. Generations over generations. Now I'm going to send my son. 
not only to talk about me, but actually to be a substitution for you. One of the things that differentiates God and Christ from the other gods is that God serves humanity, not the other way around. And when I wrapped my head around that, it changed everything. It changed everything. And so it's just really, really important that we understand this concept. And this kind of idea, this kind of gospel is pandemic proof. It's financial uh, 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 challenge proof. It's health proof. It's even marriage proof and raising kids proof in, in that we understand who the Christ is and who we are. And this concept and this idea that Jesus was just, you know, that's what he needed to do because he was the Christ became a lot more personal to me when I realized it was my lust, it was my selfishness, that if no one else had sinned in this world, God in the form of Christ still needed to die for my sins. Rocked my world. Rocked my world. And so the idea of when it talks about he who had no sin to become sin, became sin for me, it's not just a nice religious statement. It's one that is jam-packed with depth that deserves understanding, at least deserve, let me find out what this is all about. And to realize that there is nothing in me that I can offer God that says, this is payment for what you have done for me. It's laughable to even think about that. Yeah. And that's why it's called grace. Mm. That's why it's called mercy. And that's why Ephesians 2 summarizes this concept of the gospel in such a fantastic fashion that says, the incomparable grace of God, that even though we have shaken our fists at him, even though we have rejected him, even though we have said no to him, he has continued to reach out his long arms, pulling us from the muck and mire of our lives to say, I love you. I love you. This is how I'm going to communicate this to you. And there is so much more to talk about this idea. And like I said, one of the main goals that I have here today is to pique your interest, is, is, is the idea, maybe let's start here. Let's start about figuring out how this all works. And, you know, there are times that we will talk about how, you know, fallen Christ brings about certain, certain benefits to it. But this faith community do not believe that that is the gospel. It's not something that we focus on. It absolutely, there are multi benefits to it. But what we try to focus on, if you're trying to find out about our faith community, is that this is the essence of who we are and whose we are. Who we are are wretched sinners in need of a savior. Whose we are is this God who says, I am going to wrap my arms around you and I will pay whatever price that needs to be paid so that you can understand who I am. That's the essence of what the gospel is all about. And so that's what I wanted to start and, 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 and help you to, to talk a little bit about it. And so I'm very, very interested in knowing if you have any questions for, is there something that you would like for me to illuminate on uh, or, or, or have I totally wrecked your faith? Let's not do that. But uh, let's 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 have a few minutes for a discussion, maybe, and some question and answer or comments or what have you. But um, one of the greatest things 
about a faith community is not that we live this Christian life on our own, is that we live within a community and we can encourage one another, we can hear from one another, we can hear the journey that we're experiencing so that ultimately we can understand what God meant when he said, in Christ Jesus, it's the totality of his kindness expressed in Christ. That is a bold statement. Mm -hmm. And I would say that if there's anything we want to investigate, it has to be that concept of how does God's kindness show itself in the cross of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's what got me 34 years ago and still gets me to this day. Oh, I stumble at times and I hit my head and I sometimes it bleeds and, and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? I'm so grateful that God and his mercy, get this, never ends. That's a concept that is so difficult for us. Yeah. Thoughts, questions, comments? Question. Someone had some questions. Okay. All right. A question. How does a person with health, uh, uh, mental illness Hearing voices pray when voices are so disruptive. That's that's a very good question. You know, it's one of that's a thank you for even sharing that. It's a very challenging thing. Uh, one thing I know is this: that God is a merciful and gracious God. That there is nothing that we have experienced that He doesn't, uh, He can't control or or figure it out. And I honestly think sometimes when people have challenges in their lives, it's because not that it makes it simpler, but God really believed that you can handle this. And, and sometimes it's where the faith community that you're even a part of is gracious and welcoming and understand that there are challenges like never before, especially during this pandemic, mental emotional challenges that we face. And this community of faith can really help us to navigate these times in our lives. And I don't think it's the exact same thing, but it's sort of like if, if someone in our faith community, let's look at something that's a little bit more obvious, doesn't have arms and legs or, and can't eat, what are we going to do? We're going to rally to help. We're going to rally to serve. And so this is not about ostracizing people and say, what's wrong with you? It's a time for us to show the mercy and grace that was extended to us so that we can actually be helped. Now, a church is difficult in the sense that we're, sometimes some churches don't have trained people to help. I think sometimes seeking some expert people who, 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 who are expert in that area can really help us uh, navigate through this difficult time. Yeah. No, I, I think a couple of things, um, Janice, I, I really just, first of all, appreciate your courage in asking that question. Um, I think one thing that's really important is uh, within the faith community that we have this conversation more, right? I think there's an intimidation that people have with mental illness. Um, I don't know that in our faith community, it's so much a stigma as it is an intimidation where people are fearful of engaging because they don't know what to say or how to say it. but I think the more we have this conversation I think the more people are going to understand you know just like any other illness the more you understand an illness the more comfortable you will be with engaging with people right and so I appreciate the question I think the thing with with prayer, and I'm not speaking specifically to the mental illness, because I think, as Tony was saying, with mental illness, um, it is super important to be under the care of a physician, somebody who understands that and is able to help you on that level. But I think when you're in that battle, and you're trying to understand God's spiritual voice versus what you might be hearing, it's always good to compare what you're saying with scripture. And then if you can't figure it out from there, talk with somebody. Sometimes just saying, this, is, this, is this off? Like, do you, does this make sense to you? Sometimes even just that other person can just say, you know what, I think this is probably something where professionally you might, you might get some more help. 
Um, but I, but I really just want to say how much I appreciate you asking that question because I think that in and of itself, that courage to speak is awesome. But I think um, Dr. Ganguly might have a question or a response. Go ahead. I think there's kind of a neat spiritual principle, and feel free to chip in with me on this. But there's a, there's a scripture that says a gift is a gift is acceptable according to what you have not acceptable to what you do not have. So in the church, we have a wide range of skills and abilities. Some of us have physical impairments. Some of us have mental impairments. But there's a story in, in one of the gospels about a poor widow. Jesus was watching people putting money into the treasury and she put in a very small amount of money, but it was all that she had. And it specifically says that Jesus was amazed at her faith because of a large amount of money. No, it was a small coin but she gave all that she had. So for me, th this, this shows me that God, God looks at what I do in the context of what he's given me. Right. So whether he's given me a lot or a little, like in our congregation, we have, have, a, have a brother who has severe mental illness, has spent a lot of time in mental institutions, is one of the most spiritually fruitful people mm -hmm. I have ever met in my life, period period, including evangelists and everyone. And so th the beautiful thing is God turns these things completely on, on their heads. Yeah. And, and, and so I don't think any of us needs to feel discouraged. The other, other simple thing is I think you were hinting, Melanie, is, you know, sometimes sometimes maybe just actually pray the Bible, pray the prayers in the Bible, because then you, then one can, can read them. And the final point is I, I know I've heard talks by believers who are who also worked in the field of mental health. No Christian should ever feel bad about taking prescription medications, whether it's for physical illness or mental illness. To imply that that is a lack of faith is just a lie. That is just a complete and utter, utter lie, you know? That's anyway. right. Feel free to comment, Tony or Melanie. I, I don't like what you're sharing. Sharing that that makes me irrelevant. <laughs> and um, and so and so, can you keep your comments down next time? <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. That's, That's awesome. I, I mean, there's nothing to add. It's fantastic, and yeah. and uh, it's great insight. And and I and I think it's 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 what it means. You know, you know. I remember I read I read a, a short story one time, and a guy shared about how he. Um, he was a college tennis player, and and he uh, and the crowd was amazed. And he had a winning record in college tennis. And um, the amazing thing is that he was one-handed. And he shared at the end of it. He says, "You know, while my handicap may look obvious, there are a lot of you that have handicaps that are not as obvious. It's just it just matters is whether or not we we are willing and able to share it." And, and, and I think absolutely, this is where the faith community needs to get into the century, so to speak, and, and be a, a safe haven. And hey, listen, we all stumble in many ways. And, and, and I think it's really, really important. Thank you so much for sharing that. Amen. Awesome. And thoughts, questions? Yes. Awesome. Any other questions? Comments? Wow, I was that comprehensive. <laughs> I mean, there it was just absolutely that. That is awesome. I just need to sell this tape. That's what I need to do. <laughs> uh, no, that's great. Uh, um, you know, I just, I just really, if I can implore you, as as what, who? Someone said Benji. Benji. Yes, Benji. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, uh, thank you so much for all you guys sharing. I, I, it's so funny. I feel like we love to make things complicated. And it's some of the most simple things that are hard to live out. And I think, you know, God makes it very simple, this message very simple. Uh, but we like to complicate things. So I, I appreciate the simplicity in the way you communicated God's love and even <laughs> Jesus' sacrifice and what he came to do. Um, so I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. And you know what, you know, it's, it, it's an interesting thing. You know, the, the, I've heard this phrase before, the sinners of yesterday become the Pharisees of tomorrow. 
And, and the idea there is sometimes, you know, it's why the learned, so to speak, and nothing against people who are learning, but sometimes it's, we got to be careful that we don't overcomplicate things. It was people yeah. who, who had a challenge with, with uh, Jesus because of the simplicity of his message at times. Yeah. And um, so I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you for highlighting um, the simplicity so of the gospel. Cool. Well, did someone have their hand? No, someone else. Okay, that's great. Well, awesome. Uh, here, here's what I want to implore you. Like, like it said in uh, in um, Second Corinthians five, I implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Mm -hmm. And if I can communicate anything to you today, it's this. We are a faith community that want to reach out, that we feel that we are beggars who have found bread, and we want to bring you to the place where bread can be found. Mm. And, and it doesn't make us better than you are. All it does, it makes us to know where to find this bread. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is all about. And, and so you can start here. Let's, let's figure out how this all works and, and let's delve into yeah. uh, the, the, this, this idea of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Were you going to say something? Nope. Okay, I was awesome. just making sure there was no other questions. Fantastic. Well, let's have a prayer. If we can have a, a closing prayer, I think that would be great. And uh, Jamila, can you close us in a prayer?